was very smart in getting a morning person to start the morning session. Um, so hopefully I can give you a guided tour through agent-based modeling and complexity science. It is my opinion that these can constitute a theoretical platform that can help us go forward in a better understanding of world systems of humans. Um, these are my institutions. I'm at Washington State University and Université de Franche-Comté. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you, of course, afterward with any questions and whatnot. OK, so my two main questions that I'm going to be focusing on today are, do complexity approaches provide a theoretical platform in archaeology? And I'm going to go very briefly through this in interest of time. And I'm going to talk about whether or not agent-based modeling should be used for all platforms. Now, I teach undergraduates, so I'm used to people falling asleep on me early in the morning. But during this part, it'll be kind of an audience participation part. And so I expect all of you to reach into your inner morning person and humor me, OK? All right, so we'll start off with do complexity approaches provide this theoretical platform? These are basically the two main theoretical paradigms. Um, this idea of processualism and post-processualism, and I'm not going to go over the nitty-gritty of these, but a lot of the time we talk about these as diametric opposites. Processualism was, of course, coming out of this idea that old archaeological approaches were not very scientific, and so they used the scientific method to try and understand the past. Well, unfortunately, in a lot of these ways of trying to understand the way that things happen in the past, it was basically just a materialist approach. The post-processualists came around and said, you can't be so materialist. You have to start thinking about the little guy. You have to think about how everybody experiences things differently. And one of the problems in this agency-based approach is it lacks any structure. And so these are two potentially opposite ends of the coin, right? You have someone who really cares about structure and looks at materialism, and you have those who, who really care about the individual experience. If you've come to any of my other talking at you sessions, you know that I really use complexity science, and I've used images of birds. I'm passing through those today. But complexity, I see as a bridge, essentially, between these two approaches. Why? Because we care about the individual in complexity science approaches, and this individual then interacts with other individuals, and those interactions create these non-linearities that you can't explain merely by summing the parts of individual approaches to create these overarching societies. I think that this gives us an ability to understand how the actions of individuals help structure greater wholes. And so this acts as this conduit between these two main archaeological approaches. That's all I'm really going to say about that today. I personally use complex adaptive systems approaches to understand human behaviors and how their actions and interactions of people affect social structures and the environment. I care about how the environment shapes people, how people interact with that, and how they interact with each other to deal with environmental problems. One of the classic examples of this in American archaeology is Chaco Canyon, up here on the right, where you have, at the very beginning, a very small settlement that grows into one of the largest settlements in the North American area. I think that the deep time of archaeology provides us countless examples of cascading effects of human-environment interaction. If any of you have read Jared Diamond's Collapse, which is a very reductivist view of the past, you know that these ideas are not new. But people can, just by being people, interact with the environment and alter it. And by everyone interacting with the environment and altering it in small ways, it can lead to a lot bigger problems. I think that archaeology provides us a means to understand past environmental changes so that we can look at this trajectory of human adaptation so that we can confront some of the challenges we're facing today. OK, that's it for there. All right, here is the call and response part of the morning. Should agent-based modeling be used for all problems? If any of you have come to our previous tutorial,
skill on agent-based modeling or a roundtable, you probably have an idea of what agent-based modeling is. It's one of the computational approaches that complexity science uses, excuse me, um, to really look at the past. You create little agents in silico and you let them run around with various heuristics to try and understand various outcomes. So, okay, we're gonna have a couple examples in a minute. One of the reasons I think that we model is because we can't take a time machine, unless you're Colin Wren, and go back in time. I don't know if you remember telling me you have a time machine, yeah. <clears throat> take your time machine, go back in time, and survey the people in the past and ask them why they're doing things. If Stephen Jay Gould says, wind back the tape of life to the early days of the Burgess Shale, let it play again from an identical starting point, and the chance becomes vanishingly small that anything like human intelligence would grant, grace the replay. So how do we understand a past that may be contingent upon all these little things happening to create where we are today? I think that agent-based modeling provides us one way so that we can wind back the tape of life. We can create models based on our understanding of archaeology or anthropology and look at the outputs and compare those to archaeology. I think that in archaeology it's very difficult to run experiments. We can have hypotheses on how things happened. We can run experimental archaeology, flint napping and um, reductivist techniques on butchering, but true experiments are very difficult in archaeology. When we dig up what we have, we destroy it. ABM provides us one way to deal with that. We look at the action and interaction of agents through space and through time, and this enables us to look at this tape of life. This way, it's kind of a bottom-up approach to understanding larger systems, where my agent and this other agent may interact to form a larger whole. Okay, so when we want to use an ABM, Generally speaking, you want to use it when the model is spatial, so you have space, you may have a GIS data plane, you might just have an X and Y space. There is heterogeneity among the agents, so your agents don't all want to be the same. And there may be dynamics in real systems that we want to test. We only create models for things that we really want to know about, otherwise it's a waste in time. I think that there are oftentimes more appropriate means than a computationally expensive model to understand a system. I don't think agent-based models are the go-to for everything, but I think that they're useful for certain questions. Okay, so here's our game show. Should I ABM this? You don't have buzzers, you're just gonna raise your hands, you're gonna shout at me, I don't know. Reach into your inner morning person. Okay, should I ABM this, part one. I want to know where I would expect to find a site on the landscape, okay? I have a very large landscape of, let's say, northwestern Wyoming. I want to know where I might find sites because, let's say, a pipeline is going through this area. This is a very common problem. So I have detailed GIS data planes, and I'm going to create a model allowing agents to create settlements. Do you think I should ABM this? Can I have the yeses? Can I have the noes? No. Can you yell no so Isa doesn't sound so sad? <laughs> Come on. No, right? So why not? Probably not, I say, but I think it's a definite not. Predictive modeling is something that is really good. It's really good at using GIS to look at where you might find things. It's a static kind of landscape. You don't need things to interact to see where things would be. If all you care about is finding sites for your survey, an agent-based model is kind of an expensive approach. And I don't mean that it costs money, because agent-based modeling is dull. The platforms are free. But it costs your time. And if you're anything like me, your time is more valuable than spending time on a worthless model. OK, should I ABM this? Question two. I have an odd mix of lithic materials in my assemblage. I have different kinds of things. I might have some knife river flint, I might have some obsidian, etc. I want to know if an embedded procurement strategy would have created this mixing. We all should be familiar with that term. So I've sourced the materials for all the lithics from my site, I have GIS data planes for the whole area, and I know where sources are. Is this going to be a good model? Isa says, uh, yeah, so everyone should agree with Isa. Okay, so yeah. Yes, 
Definitive yes. Why? Good spatial data, weird mixing of artifact types. It's an interesting question. Why were the people living at site A going out of our way to get stuff at these other sites and bringing it back? Does it make sense if these places are really far apart? The developed theory of embedded procurement provides a strategy to model. So in this way, I think all models are based on theory, because we all create theories about our environment. And theories are just verbal models we make in our heads. We make formalized models to test those theories. OK, so I'm going to talk you through a model that I made. Um, what time am I allowed? Five minutes. Good. Um, that has recently been published in an open, uh, open access journal online. Simulating littoral trade, modeling the trade of wine in the Bronze Age to Iron Age transition in southern France. This is going to be very rapidly through it. OK. As I was writing this, I read Umberto Eco, who I like. And at the beginning of this story, uh, he starts out with these two characters, Niketas and Baudolino. Niketas then asked for some wine and poured a cup for Baudolino. See if you like this. It's a resinous wine that many Latins find disgusting. They say it tastes of mold. Assured by Baudolino that this Greek nectar was his favorite drink, Niketa settled down to hear his story. So in this little snippet here, we see an interesting idea. Latins versus Greeks. So people from Italy versus people from Greece, creating different kinds of wine. And do these people prefer the same kind of wine? How does preference drive the way that we decide to purchase things? In my model, my question is how can we understand the replacement of Etruscan wine by Greek wine in southern France? A very brief history, Etruscans arrive in southern France in around 700 BC-ish. They bring wine, everybody loves it, people have been drinking beer before that, every rich person starts drinking wine, and then all of a sudden Greek wine starts replacing it. And so the question is, why does this happen? Is this because of some kind of supply problem on the Etruscan side? Not a lot of evidence for that. Is this because of some local phenomenon? So I want to look at this from a completely local viewpoint. Due to the paucity of some of the archaeological data, agent-based modeling provides a way to look at the switch from Etruscan to Greek, Greek wine by preference. And preference can be influenced by a number of things. The evidence is that only wine drinking paraphernalia was find, found in Gaul. You go to other places around the region, and you know Etruscans were showing up with all the stuff in their boats, and people were buying everything else. The Gauls, they only wanted wine. They only wanted amphora. There's little to no evidence of what wine was traded for. So we know they got wine. We don't know what the Etruscans and later the Greeks got for it. People have inferred grain, metal, salt, and even slaves. And we can talk about that later if you want. We see both Etruscan and Greek goods side by side in ships for a very long time. We see Etruscan and Greek graffiti side by side. But we can source these ceramics and we know that they come from Greece or from Etruria. And so we know that there's something going on, why they switch. Etruscan and Fora become, they just disappear. People don't prize them, they don't hold on to them. They just disappear after a certain amount of time. And so what really happens? So when I started my second PhD in France, my advisor was really interested in me exploring this. These are these artifact curves that I've been talking you through where number one is Etruscan, number three is Greek, number two is a weird archaic type, number four is Roman, and I'm not really looking at number four, but I think that by understanding local preference choices, this may help us to understand that later transition. So this work takes place in the Languedoc-Roussillon region of southern France. I created a model that uses two populations, generally, Gauls and merchant populations, so these colonists who come in. And I created this model in multiple steps, and I'm just going to talk about two, where there are Gauls and then the two merchant populations. Number one is basically just making sure my model is working. OK. So I get let Gauls show up on the landscape in the first step. They start farming. 
I let Etruscans show up in the 100th step, they start trading. They can only get grain through trade of wine. Gauls don't need wine for anything really, they can survive by just eating grain. Wine is a luxury good. So there are two different strategies here. You have Gauls who might want wine so that they can decrease their harvest costs. You have Etruscans and later Greeks who need grain so they want to trade wine. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm switching through these things and we can come back to them if you have questions about why these things are important and how I calculated the metrics in my model. Um, the main question is basically, how did this preference, which could be based on cost, could be based on taste, all kinds of things, how this created different assemblages. So I modeled many different preference values and I let the agents um, trade. I let them engage in trade through the simulation and here is what we see. Modeling different parameters for these trade values, I was expecting to see a certain amount of switch, of course, when you have something, someone that's that's preferring one type over another. But in my model, I allowed both the Gaulish agents and the merchant agents to initiate trade. And there were certain probabilities of the trade being successful. So even when Gauls have 100% preference for one type of wine over the other, they are still likely to trade because of stochasticity, the ability for merchants to initiate trade. What I saw in my model is essentially a phase transition between having both colonists wine types um, represented on the landscape in um, when trade is 50 to around 70 and 30 is where the switch end, takes place. So even if there's not 100% preference for one type of wine over another, we still start seeing these um, artifact percentages changing. Okay. I realize that this sounds very, the way I'm explaining it, as if it's built into my model. Um, but one of the things that I did uh, look at when building this model was allowing for this other kinds of stochasticity, allowing for economics to take place and to influence the decisions of what you're going to buy and where you're going to live. I looked at, so those were the artifacts and these are the population curves where we have blue as the Etruscans, red as the Gauls, and pink as the Greeks. And you can see how population is closely related to whether or not you can eat and how much you can store in grain and whether or not you have enough grain to reproduce. So even when I see a declining amount of Etruscan amphora due to con consumption, the amount of trade, we still see that Etruscans are able to exist on the landscape for a long time. So what do I care about this? You don't need Etruscans to dis disappear for their vessels to become replaced by Greek vessels. Etruscans can still be around a bit. Um, what you really care about is how the Gauls are interacting um, with the local colonists for, um, for this luxury good. As Etruscan wares decline, later on, there is actually a little bit of a population increase. And that's, I think, because these Etruscans, this is because the Etruscans are able to store enough grain that they still can reproduce until some of them can because of how their ability to store. They can reproduce um, until their grain, wears, uh, their grain stores wear out. This model was made because there's a heterogeneous population. Households are different sizes. There are different types of agents. Um, it's spatial. It's asking an interesting question that many French archaeologists have been wondering for a long time. Why did Etruscan wine disappear anyways? And it's, as far as I know, it the first French agent-based model for this area. So why complexity? This model helps telescope between the individual, the Gaul or the Greek or the Etruscan, and the overarching system. Can we see this assemblage-wide change? We can see agency of the individuals, their choices in buying, as well as the structure of the population of both agents and artifact types. And this simple model helps us to arrive at an answer for a question that's been bothering French archaeologists for a while. Thank you very much. <laughs>